I'm Dr. David Wallace, and this is Coffee Talk. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the chair of the guitar department at Berkeley College of Music, and welcome to another Coffee Talk. As usual, we are joined by our assistant chair, Cheryl Bailey. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, I'm doing the OG coffee mug. Uh, Cheryl's got the black the one. The first, yeah. first round. I've got the white one. And you know, Cheryl, you can order these coffee mugs now on the Berkeley. Oh, do tell, Dr. Yes. Perlick. <laughs> on the website of uh, the Berkeley Bookstore, you can order our official Berkeley Guitar Department diner coffee mug in honor of Coffee Talk. And the great thing about it is when you do that, a percentage of the proceeds goes to the scholarship fund for continuing students. So we're really excited about it. Mugs are super cool. They have the new logo on it that Ben designed um, and they're available now. You can also get a t-shirt to go with your mug, but the mugs are our favorite. That was the big triumph of the summer. So they're finally there now in the fall. Um, and um, joining us as usual is the designer of our of our gear and our logo, our senior coordinator, Ben Cody. Hey, Ben. Hello. I'm still waiting on the royalties for the design. <laughs> Might be waiting a long time, but it's for the benefit of the students, Ben, you know, and you're an alum, you know, you know, um, and our special guest today is the chair of the string department, Dr. David Wallace. Hey, Doc Wallace. Good afternoon. Happy to be here. Yeah, we're thrilled to have you. Um, strings are our natural partner, as everyone knows, in a music school. Um, and so, and not only uh, we're going to get into this, but at Berkeley, the string department has your traditional string instruments, violins, violas, cellos, basses. <clears throat> oh, um, bass no basses. I know. <laughs> right. Bass goes in the bass department, right? But you do, but in the sense that you you have the contemporary orchestra that you work with, that you have some ensembles, there will be a bass or two coming up to you, as there will be guitar players who also double on instruments like mandolin, ukulele, um, all kind mandola, all the types of fretted stringed instruments. Um, that we love, quattro, all of these things um, also live in the string department and then come back and forth. So the string department at Berkeley is this really great meeting place of all string instruments, and then it's connected to both the bass and the guitar department. So that was great. I'm glad you got to correct a common misconception that I floated right out there right away. Well, um, so I guess, go ahead. This kind of leads into our first question that we ask everybody. Um, and then uh, like, which is like, what was it like for you to come to Berkeley as a violist and a string player? Like, what were the things that struck you um, as being interesting or different or new? Well, I mean, I my beginning at Berkeley, um, well, I guess actually it starts probably with being a teenager and buying some of Matt Glazer's books. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Matt Glazer had chaired the string department for about 28 years and now is the artistic director of American Roots. But he was like one of the first uh, authors to publicize really good, legit transcriptions of jazz violin, as well as bluegrass fiddle and all these things. I mean, that's one of the great things. Uh, we have Berkeley Press and there's all these wonderful resources. So even like in my early 20s, I was buying Matt Glazer books or reading his articles and, um, you know, came across them a lot. The first in-person encounter of Berkeley was through the Berkeley summer programs. In from 2011 to 2014, the Berkeley summer string program brought in Mark O'Connor, the fiddler and composer, and um, basically was the visiting artist. And what Mark did was he brought his whole crew in, you know, people who had been, he would created these fiddle camps that were really ecumenical. When I grew up, it's like, you know, bluegrassers wouldn't talk to Texas swing musicians. And if you had, if you didn't have four fine tuners on your instrument, you were a suspect because you probably were one of them long haired musicians studying classical music or whatever. And you know, people didn't quite talk to each other. So one of the things that really started to change and Berkeley was has been a big part of this was, um, you know, there started to be these fiddle camps and festivals where it's like, let's bring together great musicians from many different styles and backgrounds and have the students learn from all of them. 
and you know you're having meals together all these things i mean it's it's similar to like some of the guitar camps or or what you do with guitar sessions and so i started teaching uh for mark in 2002 and then so when berkeley said hey we want to host these one of the things he did in addition to using quite a few of the berkeley faculty was bring in some of his longtime teachers and so i remember this one experience very clearly i was in Studio 1W, Colvin Hall, on the first floor of 1140 Boylston, giving a master class. And I had a Dr. Beat metronome that was kind of on its last legs. You know, it wasn't just the battery, but it was the electronics were kind of fried and it barely had a signal. And, you know, I mean, first of all, I spent a lot of time in the classical world. And for the most part, you do not have sound people at your master classes. But I had a sound person at sound tech who comes up there while I'm fiddling around trying to figure out how to get the last juice out of this Dr. Beat. And it looks like, it was, I think I can run that into a DI and we can have it over the mains. And so he hooks up a DI to my Dr. Beat and suddenly this dying thing is a very functional metronome. And I remember taking picture and video of that, like what is this wonderful place where the classes have sound people and they have technology and the people can rescue you and things actually work, you know? And so it was this, it was this kind of um, beautiful sense of a place. And also, I mean, it's Melissa Howe was string chair at that time. And she was very much, she somehow managed to get a very good lunch budget and was taking all the guest faculty out to lunch, picking their brains, talking with them about stuff. And, you know, I really kind of got to know a lot more of what was happening at Berkeley and the Berkeley string department. What I didn't know was she was thinking about going on sabbatical and looking for people to potentially come in. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I, I was learning a lot of things when I wasn't teaching. I was always going to classes, just trying to further my education as much as I could. Uh, you know, one of the things I heard about was there's this guy named Rob Thomas, and he's got this jazz scale book, which is like, it's mandatory. Everybody's got to have this. You know, you've you've got to, you know, get it. It's, he's like the jazz bebop drill sergeant, and you got to learn these scales. And so he wasn't there that particular summer, but I was like, I got to get this scale book and <laughs> went to the Berkeley bookstore and they're like, this doesn't exist. I'm like, what? What do you mean it doesn't exist? It's it's called a modern method for, for chord scales on the violin. And uh, no, it's not out there. It's not only do we not have it, it's not there. And I realized, oh, wow, it's it's like the real book. You've got to know somebody and, and get a copy or something. I mean, it turns out, you know, back then I was living in New York and Rob lived only like about a five minute walk south of me. And so, you know, I, I hit him up and I said, you know, I'd love to to take some lessons and and study with you. And I'd love to get the the book, you know, can I buy any? And the thing was at that time, he was saying that, um, you know, the book isn't done yet. I'm still revising it or whatever. He had been tweaking it for a long time. I'm happy to say you know, when I did come to Berkeley and did become chair, one of my missions was to get a lot more books out there because I knew that that changed me. It opened up new worlds because the schools I was going to, they weren't necessarily teaching you jazz, fiddling or improvisation. We had to go somewhere else to find that. Um, and, you know, so I'm really happy to say Rob did get his book finished. It, he got it published as a modern method for violin scales on Berkeley Press. It sold out of its first printing. And even today he was texting me because there's going to be a viola version, you know, so it's going to change uh, the world, you know. But I, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I always loved about when I came here as chair was just constantly learning new things, hearing new things. Um, hearing and learning about instruments I'd never heard of for the first time, because, I mean, that's one of the things that you alluded to is we have our main principal instruments in our department. We've got violin, viola, cello, um, then harp came along a little bit later. And then we now officially have banjo and mandolin as principal instruments. That was something I got done officially. But before that, there was this thing called the acoustic string principle. Um, there was around 
in the early 2000s, there was a young mandolinist by the name of Joe Walsh, not the Joe Walsh of the Eagles, who would be familiar to you all, and who's in the Berkeley uh, computer system because he got an honorary doctorate at some point, you know, but in any case, uh, not Joe Walsh of the Eagles, but Joseph K. Walsh of Minnesota and bluegrass fame, but he showed up and took a Berkeley audition because he wanted to come and learn the kinds of things that guitars were learning. And there was no, I mean, most schools don't have degrees for mandolin, period, but, you know, certainly most of what would have been out there would be classical mandolin, but he was specifically wanting to learn jazz language. Bluegrass was doing a lot of like Bela Fleck, David Grisman type things. And so at the time, Matt Glazer went to Matt Marvulio, the dean, and he's like, well, you know, let's let's do it. He can play. Let's let's bring him in. But we don't know if we're ever going to get another mandolin. So rather than go through all the trouble just saying, OK, here's the requirements that a mandolinist has to do in this order to get a Berkeley degree, let's create a principle called the acoustic string principle. And that way we can say yes to any stringed instrument that comes along that we think, okay, yes, we, we can teach you here. So currently, you know, we've got roughly 20 acoustic string principles. I probably won't remember all the instruments, but we have quite a few Chinese instruments, Gujang, Pipa, Arhu, and multiple players on, on those. Uh, Ruan, we have a lot of instruments from the Middle East, Oud, we have two tar players currently, one from Iran, one from Turkey. We have um, Kanun, we've had Kamancha, and we also have instruments from South America and the Caribbean. So usually we'll have a Puerto Rican cuatro or maybe Venezuelan cuatro. And, and a lot of those students do wind up taking some of their studies in guitar because you have musicians who are very skilled on those instruments or specifically covering Latin music and the styles that they play. And and sometimes we've been getting uh, some more ukulele players. That's one coll fun collaboration that Kim and I were working on was uh, Karen Hogue, who's taught mm -hmm. guitar sessions, has written some lovely books for um, ukulele that Berkeley Press published. And she's also sent us some really wonderful students. So um, the beauty of having those kinds of influences and those kinds of instruments is the jams and the music that's swirling through the halls. It's it's music from different backgrounds, different traditions. And so you also have um, a, a real fusion of genres, a creation of new music, and sometimes the introduction of instruments and traditions where there wasn't previously a place for them. And I love all that. You know, I don't know of any place but Berkeley where this is happening. There's a lot of schools who want to be Berkeley, but there's only one Berkeley. Right. You know, I think that's kind of amazing because the question itself was so short. It was like, what is your first impressions of Berkeley? And it took you on this yeah. <laughs> history, you know, it took you on the full history of the of the string department. And I think that's so telling because um, it's hard to to not be impressed when you come to a place like this and and you've had this sort of life experience or expectation that things are smaller in scope. And then you start to um, have that sense of, wow, you know, there's so many different avenues. And it's nice to hear you talk about it because it is similar to the guitar in the sense that even though the difference is that you actually have different instruments in the string department, we have so many different styles. Yeah. And what I really like about what you said was that the breadth of the string department didn't diffuse the depth that you want to see. And and that's, you know, that was an interesting thing because I mean, a lot of people don't realize it and uh, hopefully I won't step out of my lane at all, but you know, I, Matt Glazer would tell me the story of like this one time he was in the hall and he was he was just saying I'm terrible at my job I hate this it was like talking about the computer the stress the you know the software that we've got to use and uh it's it's easy to get bogged down in that and you know the dean at the time Matt Marvulio said uh 
well, let's find you a better job. You know, let's let's find something that you'd really love to do. And they were in the process. I'm sure they were already thinking about starting this American Roots um, music program. And then when there was the opening for the chair, Melissa Howe, who had been teaching viola and classical music, sight reading, ear training, and some other courses and was full time at Berkeley, had gotten the job for chair. And she said, I had a choice. I... I could have either gone deeper into bluegrass and jazz, which were basically the two things we were good at and known for, or I could go broader and open the whole thing up. And from what she says, it sounded like there was actually institutional leanings to say, hey, stay in this lane. You're doing these two things great. Let's just do them better and just keep going. But she she said, I wanted it all. You know, it's like I wanted a department where people are playing the music they love on the instruments they love. And she brought in Simone Shaheen, who's one of the leaders, leading um, uh, Arabic violinists and musicians in the world and Udists. She brought in members of the BSO. We've got Owen Young, who's in the cello section, Julianne Lee, who plays violin and viola. Um, and just started to broaden things quite a bit, you know, and so by the time she went on to her next job as, as chief of staff of President Roger Brown, um, there really was an opening to say, okay, let's bring in someone who can deal with all of this, perhaps expand it, perhaps, you know, I mean, make it better or deeper. And, you know, a lot of the the challenge for us as a department is, was, has been, I mean, that was my first big task, which took about a couple of years, was figuring out what the new proficiency requirements would be or what would what did we really want the students to learn? You know, because my boss, he handed me something. He said, this looks like a menu at a wonderful dim sum restaurant, you know, where it's so many of these different items. But I have no idea what anybody's supposed to be playing at any particular juncture or whether they're passing or not. We need a little more structure. So you know, we spent a good two years saying, you know, what do we really value? What do we think all students from Berkeley should know, even if they're just taking four semesters of lessons because they're in one of the the business or, you know, engineering majors, what is the bare essentials? And then beyond that, what is required? And it was it was a fascinating process. And there were some surprises, like, one of the things that the faculty decided unanimously, and I was not expecting this, and I certainly wasn't going to impose it, they they decided all the students should be able to play an instrument a movement of unaccompanied Bach on their instruments. And, you know, well, that's very, very much a part of the classical traditions. And and there's a lot of reasons for that, because you're learning how to voice polyphony on what really is not a polyphonic instrument. You're learning how to, to do different voices. There's harmony, there's voice leading. If you analyze the harmonies, you can actually improvise on those changes. Um, you know, and that was just one thing among many. I mean, it was everybody definitely had to be able to navigate jazz charts. Everybody has to be fluent in at least two different musical styles. You know, if you're a performance major, you've got to be great at at least four different styles. So just the different kinds of values that showed up, you know, knowing your scales, knowing the modes. And, you know, the thing that's a little different from us uh, and, you know, compared to guitar woodwinds, we ultimately decided that people couldn't take a linear path through the proficiency standards just because you might have someone who came through... Uh, a classical orchestral program, they know the full range of their instrument, they have all these other things, but maybe they haven't improvised yet. And you might have someone who's a phenomenal by ear player and improviser, but maybe their reading skills are not so solid. And so in a sense, we almost said, okay, if you're just taking four semesters of lessons, you've got to do all these requirements at some point in those four semesters. And, you know, and so the teachers help to track that. And, you know, we're able to keep tabs on where people are. And again, that we call them like the the minimum requirements. We don't certainly have any restrictions. If someone's done all of those things, they're welcome to do more and other things. But it's a pretty heavy lift, you know, when, when you look at what we're asking. 
And, you know, sometimes you scratch your head and you say, well, are we, are we asking too much? Should we take some things out? But ultimately we decided, well, you raise, you put the bar here, you know, and if, if people need a little help getting and meeting the bar, you know, then give them the help that they need. Or if you need to change things or find an alternative that makes it more accessible to them in one way or another, that's fine. But if you put the bar here, then you're not really doing the students or the field any favors by not giving people what they need, you know, because I think the challenge is Berkeley's a wonderful environment in many ways, but it's a little bit of a cocoon. And when you graduate, you're out there in the world. You might not have a professor whose door you can knock on and have an office hour or a Title IX office or any number of things, and you have to pay for your own counseling that does not, you know, is not covered by tuition money. So, I mean, it's, I think that's one of the challenges that our professors and we're always finding is how do you provide that love and support and also enough of a real world uh, perspective in education so that the transition to pr the professional life is smooth. And it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, I think one of the things that I really like in hearing the whole story of of the string department in such a short, concentrated time is that, you know, we're all looking for ways to be expressive and, and to be creative, but also to go really deep into what you do. And I think the guitar curriculum, you know, it's gone through all the same incarnations. It's just older here at Berkeley, not in the world, but at Berkeley, it's older. And we had at one time, Cheryl remembers the days um, of when you had the proficiencies for guitar were the proficiencies that you had to know before you left and they weren't connected to a final exam. And then over time, the chairs just decided, okay, we're gonna put them connected to each semester. So that each semester you're practicing going through this rigor of building your foundation and as people come in, you know, like at the time, it was revolutionary to have a proficiency um, in popular styles of music. And now more and more that it's become kind of a second nature at Berkeley, people will ask the questions like, do we really need this? And then it comes down to the people who have been out in the field and really working, who are the faculty saying like, yeah, in fact, you will really need this. And you do really need this. And just because something seems simple or seems accessible musically doesn't mean it's not deep on the instrument. And so I love everything you're saying because from the string perspective, it's reinforcing um, what, what we see in the guitar perspective, which I think it shows how aligned the guitar and the strings really are, you know, besides the fact that we yeah. both play strings, you know? I yeah. Mean, I mean, it's funny because it's like, I'm always making a disclaimer and saying, yeah, I've got about 230 students, but you got to understand, you know, there's so many guitars and so many basses that they have their own department, but there is so much communication. And in some cases it gets really fluid, especially with the students who are playing like a quattro or, or ukulele. And it's, it's, um, it opens up some really nice avenues, you know, and I look to you all, you know, I mean, even just, we were, looking at the new learning management system we're all going to be on canvas and mm -hmm. you know just seeing the way you handle your curriculum or even the things you're doing with berkeley online a lot of times guitar has been kind of the vanguard and and leading the way into some of these things and so i'm always looking for all right what is guitar doing how does that apply what are some ways we could um learn from that but uh yeah and i mean i think i think that's the other thing and it, the American Roots minor and the American Roots program kind of lives in the in the string department. And so that's also a good place where everything comes together. In fact, I think it's November 13th. We were just, I was just uh, partnering with Matt Glazer. There will be a bluegrass jam happening on the fifth floor. Of that's great. Yeah, a lot of our students get involved there yeah. because the the artist in residence for years yeah. and years, Woody Man, before he passed away, and then Paul Rochelle with Annie, and they do a lot of great guitar stuff. And then Ian Steed, um, who everyone knows from this podcast in um, episodes past, runs um, the Flat Picker Club, 
And that's that's been a lot of traction. That's been yeah, it's a really great great thing, and um, and also connects us to the history, like American history, so much of of our shared history, uh, which is so great. So okay, so to lighten it up, there was a first question that I forgot to ask that everyone has to answer on the podcast, and. Now, different colleagues of ours have said that this relates or doesn't relate to the way they think of music. So now that we know how you relate to music and your department and its history, here's the big question. David Wallace, Doc Wallace, how do you take your coffee? This is black. Ah, okay. I, I know that's what Cheryl Bailey respects. So I I, I want her respect. So no. No, I, I typically, I, I typically have had black coffee. That that was kind of um, when I was a kid. Of course, you know, you you want coffee because your grandparents and your parents are having it. And you know, my mom's a very smart lady. She just, you know, she she didn't say, oh well, that's for grownups or whatever. She's like, all right. She gets me and my sister a cup of black coffee, and we're like, eh, okay, uh, done. <laughs> you know, and that was it. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure if she loaded up with cream and sugar, we might have reacted differently, you know, but there was no, I mean, it was, I, re, I remember that day very clearly. That was uh, mm. out at, at, at her parents. Uh, they had a beautiful place out in East Texas, you know, and, and um, mm -hmm. on a lake. And so, yeah, it's like, okay. I, and I, I didn't really have any more coffee until college, you know, but I think- yeah. You know, it's like my sister and later discuss it. It's like she she also is a black coffee drinker and, and says, you're either drinking coffee or you're not. You know, if you're going to drink coffee, drink coffee. You know, so it's just kind of I I mean, I, I'll say I'm not an, an utter purist or snob in that my wife loves cream. So, you know, that that's fine. Sometimes I'll have some I've had amazing you know, like I. I remember someone had brought me Vietnamese coffee once, you know, and just incredibly sweet and creamy. Or I think about the kinds of, uh, you know, light and sweet coffee from the Dominican Republic or things. So I I can enjoy it all. I'd rather it not be too chemically, like some of these slurp a lotty cold brew things are just a little bit, it's, I don't know. Um, okay, so foundational principles yeah. with your coffee yeah foundational like classic like traditional but with the respect yeah. for variation exactly and innovation. the the other thing is i i will i will grind my own beans so you know since this is a little later in the day this is a blend of um zabar's decaf espresso from zabar's in the upper west side in new york i'm i see cheryl nodding uh best decaf coffee in the world. I actually bring our, you know, in our division, Jamie Davis Ponce, one of the administrators, uh, she and her husband are pure decafers, but, you know, whenever one of us goes to New York, we'll usually bring back a bag and say, you know, <laughs> here you go. Happy birthday. Uh, um, you know, it's just really good. It's one of the decafs where you don't, uh, you don't realize it's decaf. I mean, it's it, to my palate, something tends to be missing. And I'm not just talking about, you know, Sanka or some of the really original powdered decaf, which is like, well, why bother, you know, but uh, the yeah. day bars has good flavor. And then uh, the other beans that I've been really into lately, there's um, at the farmer's market in Roslindale, there mm. is uh Saturday, there's a booth uh, every now and then. There's a guy, Andres Duarte, who ha he has a family that has a coffee um, farm in Colombia. And so it's this kind of bespoke Cafe Duarte um, coffee. I'll have to bring you all some beans. I mean, there's three kinds. One is kind of a more standard dark roast. And then he has some which has, you know, he, I, I don't know the Spanish word for it, but he says it's it's they call it the honey, where essentially it's like the coffee um, resin, you know, from the berry. And, you know, a lot of times people would wash that off, but they actually let it, you know, they leave that resin in, the, in that and, um, you know, it it flavors things. So there's a cup and then there's all we're also like kind of a bit more one of them's, I think, more of a green, you know, which 
you know, I don't think it's quite as roasted, but that's, so I've got a little bit of that in here too. So I'll grind the beans. I just use a good old Cuisinart, you know, steaming machine. I, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm more than happy to cave to people who are purist and love pour overs or French press or whatever, or, you know, stove espresso. I mean, it's all coffee. It's all good. It does the trick, you know, um, I, I'm not the biggest fan about the Keurig. I'll say that those, the cups come in handy. They're quick. They're good for departmental things. They're easy to clean, you know? Um, and I think those are getting better all the time, just like powdered decaf is getting better all the time. Uh, you know, if... <laughs> all right, I'm going to save you. I was going to wait for you to finish your thought, but I just saw Cheryl's face when you got into powdered decaf. And I think it's great to accept all styles and all, all uh, expressions, but you know, there might be a line that uh, Professor oh. Bailey's gonna, in the research, just, you know, I mean, you you did your thorough research and, and it was time to kick it to Cheryl anyway, to see well, what's on your mind. And I, I, I saw say those face. green beans, you should put them in your skillet and roast them. Cause yeah. I think that's what, it, during the pandemic, I started roasting right. my own oh. with the green beans and a little cast iron skillet. You learn I a lot about the whole thing. I should have talked to you. I, that was, <laughs> you know, I actually had coffee plants and, Ooh. and I grew enough beans over the years I that I, you know, this year I finally had one cup of coffee from the beans, but I didn't actually roast them. I just let them dry. Wow. I said, I was like, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I'm just going to put the whole berries into the grinder yeah but i had a lovely light wonderful cup of coffee from from my home what? coffee plant that's totally nuts i wow well, okay well we will i i mean unfortunately the plants have died because i mean the, we're we're not exactly in the in the ideal you know and i know i didn't know you I'm, could actually grow them indoors so that you could actually produce the flower I, and i didn't either but you know i should, oh, right. I should use some pictures of the you know it's like the flower is pretty you know it's it's a kind of delicate thin you know thin petal white that's, flower that's amazing and, and the berries are nice and red and uh yeah no it was uh it, it was one of those interesting projects but i i was afraid to try roasting and didn't know what would happen I'll also yeah, say you just have to experiment and maybe the first couple of times you're going to put off your fire alarm, but it's OK. Yeah. It's part of the process when you uh, till you learn about the, how the smoke comes off I, of it. I will say that I, I had to kind of disassemble my coffee grinder and, and give it a good cleaning afterwards. Just <laughs> yeah. it didn't know what was <laughs> what it hit. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> but um, hey, I was going to talk to you because we were talking about this the other day. I mean, I've had some students when I taught um, harmonic considerations, which I love to teach that class, mainly because I could get, you know, all instruments in there, not just guitar, but I had a couple violinists, I had a cellist, and I had some mandolin players in there. And it was really great to get them into, you know, writing some bebop lines and, and, um, you know, and doing some transcriptions, a couple of them just really fell in love with it and really started to see those connections between that. I got them into uh, Jacob Bandolin. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of them they didn't know. And I said, well, this is, in a way, it's kind of similar music, like bebop and choro stuff. So it was great to help them make that jump. Well, you know, with the mandolin players to make that jump to like, wow, here's this this musician that's really, there's all this music available, all the charts and stuff. Um, but also in my uh, bebop lab, now I had a, I had a mandolin player. Yeah, I have, I've had mandolin, but it's really uh, very interesting to, um, to hear those lines, how they organize them on the instrument. Also, actually the quattro too. Um, and then, you know, John Boboian one time. Yeah. He didn't have enough guitars for the bebop guitar, so they were it was the bebop quattros, the quattros, right? I remember that. Yeah, and it was great to hear. And I I became really I actually went out and looked for one in the Bronx. I got so fascinated by it, you know, to find one to hear the chord voicings, you know, jazz chord voicing on the quattro. Um, 
So I, I think um, it's really interesting to hear how those lines work. And actually, you know, Sarah Caswell, of course, on your faculty was David Baker's. Yes. Ba basically, you know, as she said, when he got older, he, she would just play the examples for him. Um, so it's cool because we had a big, you know, we, we used to tour together a bit in, in a couple projects. And, uh, but anyway, we got together one time and really shared ideas about how those lines work. And also to kind of get into David Baker's head about how he thought about them. He so, is really cool. I mean, that's one of the things I love about um, if someone comes and they specifically want to study jazz, there's so many different angles because we've got, um, you know, Mimi Rabson, who went to the New England Conservatory and has done a lot of the the downtown free jazz and really modern things. We've got Matt Glazer, who's totally into Lester Young and melodic uh, transcription and things. Jason Anik, who's, you know, he's kind of like the world's leading Grappelli style violinist right now with he uh, Rhythm Future Quartet, you know, that um, yeah. Berkeley alums are, are playing in that too, like on guitar. Um, and the thing that, and Chelsea Green, who's fantastic with like Neo Soul in, in more recent contemporary and smooth jazz, in addition to just, you know, the straight ahead things. Um, the thing that I really love about, and of course, Rod Thomas, I mean, geez, it's so deep, you know, it's, it, there's so many different places you can go to. But the thing I really love about Sarah is, um, well, there's a lot that to, to love in her playing, but, you know, she's a direct line to David Baker and his lineage. I mean, it's, if I could exchange musical upbringings with someone, I would love to have what she grew up with because she had, um, David Baker and learning jazz straight from him. And she was also studying with Joseph Gingold, the great classical violin teacher who was concert master of Cleveland Orchestra and probably his most famous students, Joshua Bell. So she had those two threads in her development and now is just doing, you know, some wonderful things in, in her own, you know, music, new record out, which is well worth a listen. Uh, uh, the Way to You is the title of it. So that's so been, a lot of good guitar on that too. You've been talking about all these different people and all these different applications and all these disparate, beautiful things in your department. But what are some of the things that you think are the central values? Like what connects you all? Or what do you think like are things that that are in common in your community? In this sure. department? Well, I think, I think there is... Um, I mean, there's a real family sense and community sense, but the ideal that um, sometimes, sometimes the instruments that we play have been shut out of different traditions or locked within, or sometimes those traditions themselves have been locking people out. And so I think there's a real sense of um, valuing all styles of music wanting to learn from all styles of music, as well as a sense that in order to have a 21st century career, you have to be creative. You, you have to be versatile. You have to be open to doing many different things. I mean, all my degrees were in classical, you know, I started on violin and started viola my fourth year of undergraduate. Then all my graduate degrees were in classical performance and viola, I grew up as a Texas style fiddler. But, you know, while I was in school, that stuff was kind of on the periphery. But one of the things that I saw, even in grad school, was the musicians who were making it were the ones who were ha were willing to do lots of different things. The people who are just like, I just want to do this one thing, were typically the ones who would, would drop out at some point. Now, Obviously, there are cases where people do the one thing and that's amazing and they do that. But I remember, um, you know, I had a, a real epiphany once where I I was just I'd, I'd gone to a, a Texas swing camp that Johnny Gimbel, the great Texas swing fiddler, had. This was came close to kind of your old stomping grounds when you were living in Texas Um it was at McClendon County Community College, you know, still a fair way from Austin, but, you know, it was a place where they had a lot of great Texas swing musicians. And one of the main teachers there was Dick Gimbel, Johnny's son. 
And I knew him as a bass player because that's what I'd seen. He played in concert, but he's teaching a class. He picks up a guitar and he sounds great on a guitar, picks up a mandolin. He's great on mandolin, picks up a fiddle. And I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I've, I've had all these people who've been kind of telling me, okay, you're a violist now. You shouldn't be playing violin or, you, you know, or, oh, you're studying classical music now. You can't play fiddle. And I'm like, this guy has no problem doing all of that. You know, and around that same time, I did my first off-Broadway show. And there's, you know, in New York, there's the utility winds player where someone walks into the pit and they literally have about 12 different woodwind instruments. And, and they play them all great. You know, maybe they're not going to play the Strauss Oboe Concerto with the New York Philharmonic that night. Maybe they are. I don't know. But, you know... I think if you're very clear about um, it, it's a challenge because I don't like to put limits on myself or other people in terms of what you're capable of, because I think if I'd done that, I I would have given up a long time ago, you know, but at the same time, I want to be realistic, you know, because sometimes students will come in and they'll have a dream and they're like, I want to play in the Boston Symphony. It's like, okay, if you want an orchestral career, you got to look at this particular line and this is what you're going to do, you know, and there might be a part of me that's, that's like, I mean, there's different parts we can have and both of them can be bad. I mean, people go follow your dreams. All you got to do is follow your heart and follow your dreams and manifest it. It will work. You know, it's like, if I want to be in the BSO, I'm not sure if I could make that. I mean, that's a tough audition. It's, it's a whole thing, you know? But at the same time, I think it can be bad to say, no, forget it, no chance. But you have to realistically know, well, if I want to get here, what's the path that gets me there? It's like you got to reverse engineer the career, you know, and, and think about, I, I mean, I got some really good advice once. There was a banjoist, Jamie Stone, uh, who's um, done a lot of original music and various things, but he actually... He said, look at some of the, the people whose careers you'd want to have, you know, maybe someone who's just a few years ahead of you, maybe someone who's extremely established and someone in the middle, but just look and say, where are they playing or what are the steps they did to get different, you know, places? Because, you know, if you don't have any scaffolding for the dream, you're not going to get there. You know, and another thing he said that was kind of interesting was, um, kind of reverse engineering tours, touring routing. It's like, look at an artist whose, you know, career you'd like to have or tour, where are they playing? Well, okay, they're playing Club Passim in Cambridge this weekend. Where are they playing directly before that? Where are they playing directly after that? And just kind of getting a sense of, of how you build that. You know, and, and I think part of it's just participating. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in the pr practice rooms. I still do, but I think I also hit a point where I realized, you know, I probably could have started to make my career happen a lot sooner if I actually got out of the practice room and spent more time with people, you know, just even in New York, they'd have a lot of classical chamber music parties or like in Irish pubs, there's sessions, you know, or just different things, um, you know, or students the students who can really hang, you know, going down to Wally's and, and sitting in at the jam sessions and things, but just ways you can interact and get to know people and experience. And I think it's all the more important, you know, it's an interesting thing to say on a podcast, but, you know, I, I think we need much more in-person engagement. You know, sometimes I'm even just seeing students where it's like, okay, this person has been cultivating their performance for a tiny screen and for TikTok and they've got a lot of experience there and they're good there, but they're that's not the same as playing a 300 seat cafe or a thousand seat venue or theater. And, and there's so many different levels of physical engagement. I mean, that was one of the things I found was when we first came back to in-person instruction, all of us had been in small rooms playing to small screens and we had to learn how to fill a space again. We had to learn how to um, project again. I think that's also one of the hard things about um, Berkeley is apart from the conservatory, we don't have reverberant spaces. And you know, if, if you're not playing amplified, you know, classical guitar, you're not just playing the guitar, you're playing the room and adjusting to the room. Same thing when you're when you're bowing. Um, and it, it's similar to like, 
an amplifier being the other half of your sound, you know, when you're when you're playing amplified. And so there there's that education of playing in the space. You know, I I really want our students to be able to get into spaces where they can learn from the space. Oh, I think that's really true. I think that's an interesting thing. And also, but also it's also something where you have to learn how to play in the space you're in. And so I think that being adaptable and learning about that, you know, when you're on a, could be on in a nice room in the conservatory and play in the room, but then you may actually have to change your instrument or change the way you're going to amplify when you play in a different hall and knowing how to do that and knowing how to do that when you don't have much time um, is such a valuable valuable part of what what we do um, as performers and I think it goes back to a little bit of what you said about um, choosing your path but understanding what it takes to to follow that path you start making choices and then there's paths you're not taking because you're making certain choices and that's okay I think that you and I kind of come from this tradition where sometimes there are certain paths there's like a hierarchy of paths in oh, people's yeah. minds yeah. and I don't think that's necessarily valuable or <clears throat> fair moving forward I think that there could just be different paths and I think that's what we're trying to set up here and that's what I hear as you're talking about all these things that you're doing in the string department that it's kind of breaking down that idea that that there's a path to an orchestra position or to as a soloist of repertoire that's the highest path and everything else is like a concession path yeah and I think instead if we think about it like everything is a valuable path and it has its own unique and really deep requirement of you it will it helps everybody because it helps everyone respect one another and then it helps people say that it's not easier to take an education path or a studio musician no, path it's, or an improvisation path yeah. it's not an easier path it's just a different path and i think that that helps all of us regardless of what path we're on so that it's great to hear you talk like that um I mean, I, I, I mean, it's it's weird how there's these flawed and artless hierarchies that are out there and they get stuff wrong, you know, about one kind of music or one kind of career. You know, I even remember just even as an undergraduate, you know, some people it was like, OK, the performance major, if you're really cool, you're a performance major. And if if you can't be good enough to be a performance major, then then you do the education. I remember thinking. This is ridiculous. That's a harder right. major. When you look at what they got to do, that's asking a lot more. Moreover, you know, I, I mean, it, it's it, it just seems so weird to me that, uh, and it's like, and what are you doing after school? And how much are you right. making? And what are they doing? You know, and at the same time, oh, yeah, you know. sure. It also robs that person, though, who does a different major than performance ah. really going after the depth of their playing that is actually required That's to right. be really good you know That's like if you want to be a great producer it helps so much if you go deep in your playing if you want to be a great teacher it's great to know how you do what you do and so i think that's what i mean when it helps everyone and yeah and i think that's why it's you know i'm i'm a big i'm a firm believer in a strong performance core that we have you know and mm -hmm. that we need ear training. We need voice leading. We need all these different things that are helping us to be. I mean, that's one of the things that I think is great. How many majors are we up to now? Like about 16 or something? I mean, there's a lot, you know. There's a lot. There's a lot. There's so you many know, ways to go about it. And I mean, one of the things that I'm always telling students, you know, who are, I mean, of course, we've got the professional music major where you are kind of choosing your major and your concentrations, but you know, I'm always telling performance majors, it's like, look, this is a this is really great training for your instrument, but let's also look at your electives and think about picking up some business or production skills or, you know, some entrepreneurship or teaching private lessons, you know, just some of the different seminars or instrument repair, just the, the opportunities to learn those parts of the vocation. And similarly, like if someone is declaring 
you know, music therapy or, or something, or even changing from performance. It's like, you know, look, you're still a musician. You're still a performer, even if, and this informs what you do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, that's the thing is all the students are musicians and they're all pursuing something. And the really good thing is when Berkeley's firing on all cylinders, it's a microcosm of the musical world, but it's also a microcosm of music industry. And so it's like, we've got our own startup companies where the, the students are putting a band together. They're getting together with engineering students to produce videos and an EP. They're getting with, together with business majors to, to route a tour and figure out things. And, you know, it's like, th there's no other school I know of where you really have that kind of critical mass and that breadth of the different jobs that are available in the industry. And it's when it's working, it's just beautiful, you know, and I love oh. to see that interaction between the departments and between the, the students and, you know, just the students are also the ones who come to us with some of the best ideas where it's like, okay, could we have an ensemble that does this? You know, there were some students who specifically, they they said, we want a directed study ensemble with Chelsea Green because after graduation, we really want to fill a need and a niche where there's starting to be a lot of strings showing up on hip hop records and contemporary jazz and R&B. And we wanna be the ones who are doing the arrangements and providing the musicians and recording. And, you know, we set up that ensemble. We did, we did it, you know, and, and those students are now graduated and doing that very work that they wanted. Now, I mean, we got to listen to the students and hear, you know, what are the possible things they have as well as we've got, because we've got so many people working professionally that they're saying, this is what's out there, or this is what's the need you need to get there. So it's that it's that community and that dialogue, which which makes it so fascinating and rich. Right. Um, hey, Ben, this sounds like a good time for you to ask your question that you always ask. Yeah. So uh, what's one question that you wish you would have asked when you were first starting out that you didn't ask that looking back? Uh, starting okay. out as a... As like a, what, as a, what's a question oh, that students yeah. should be asking? Oh, like what's a question students should be asking like that you wish you had asked when you were a student well i think for for the students who are string principals a question that they wind up asking is how do i amplify you know because that's something that a lot of times people are wanting to know we've got some specific labs to help with that um so I think that's certainly a question. Um, I think a question that I'd like them to ask themselves is, you know, what's the purpose of your music? You know, what's the purpose of you being a musician? And I think that's a really critical question for a lot of string players who start so young that they don't have a memory before they were playing a violin or something. You know, and so so sometimes it feels like a choice has been made for them, you know, that and they're wondering, did I make this choice or if I had this choice, would I make it? You know, but I think um, I think you have to look at what are my motives for doing this? What are my motives for being a musician? Because if they're not real to you, if they're not really grounded, you'll burn out, you know, you've got to have a, a solid reason, even if it's just, I love music and I love playing music with people. That's, that's a motivation enough to pursue a career in music. You know, there's a lot of other hard work that comes with it, but, you know, I think sometimes students just need to be a little clear about where am I going and why am I going? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think that's a big thing to think about, but I think that with all the pathways that we have, that's the natural thing is that now you have to start to have some courage to make some decisions and really think about where you want to go and what it's going to take to, to get there. Um, so Cheryl, now that we're kind of coming to the end of our hour of coffee um, with Doc Wallace, what's on your mind? Um, well, thanks for joining us on our show, on our podcast. 
and we have fans. I mean, obviously we have our current students and we have alum and we have just guitar nerds, but we just kind of have people that love music and creativity. So it was great that you could join us. And, you know, I, I think that's why people come and listen to the show because they're always going to have a great conversation about stuff. I, you know, I was thinking when you were talking about playing all, you know, this whole thing about performing in your sound and just the energy of performing live. The other thing I was thinking about, because it was something I was talking about with a student is it's also how you create your community and all the people that you are going to are part of your career the stuff that you're practicing in your room you know when you go out to play with others that's really where it's going to grow and you make those connections you know musically but also professionally so i think it's a, i'm glad that you're you know on the campaign to really encourage all of our everyone not just students but everyone to get out there and play so so thanks for bringing that up because I think it's it is the thing. I mean, if if or if you, if you say what would be my motivation or why do I play is for that, right? For that deeper communication between musicians, but also with the people that you're playing for. David, I guess on the heels of that, my my last thought, my last question is, how has being the chair of the string department? And setting up this environment for everyone, the way and inheriting it, stewarding it, how has it affected your own playing and your own practicing? Oh, like, man. what's changed about you? Well, I mean, I was when we were hired. The, kind of the charge was, you know, you're not just running this great department of faculty and students, but you're supposed to also um, be engaging the field as a performer or recording artist or composer writer teacher nationally if not internationally and you know i felt uh i'll call it the joy of you know using this platform to to speak to to other string players to to do a lot more for string education in terms of my own playing um you know, I didn't ever have any formal schooling in jazz or fiddling or other styles. You know, you picked it up at the festivals or you read books or or watched videos or attended camps or something. And so it's been a real time for me to get schooled. I mean, I always loved jazz and I picked up little things, but I'd never really studied it. You know, I'd never really learned the harmony and and done things. I mean, that was one of the things I did on my sabbatical. I I decided I really wanted to study. Um, I studied in depth Berkeley jazz harmony, and I studied uh, George Russell's the Lydian chromatic concept of tonal organization. And um, I had bought it, but I, I looked at it, it's like this is going to take some time, you know. And so I really dug deeply in that. You know, the thing that was really kind of cool about reading both books and studying it while I was composing on, and finishing a piano quintet was there were aspects of language that I was using and knew just instinctively. Like I was composing major seven sh sharp 11, not realizing that's what it was at the time I was, you know, sketching pieces and things. You know, but it's like to have the knowledge and be grounded in it, then you can use it intentionally and you can also work out challenges with it. You know, also my very first semester here, Simone Shaheen was teaching students in the next room and, and I'm hearing Makam and all this stuff is coming into my subconscious and everything. So the languages that people are speaking and playing are coming out in my own compositions. Um, I think the rhythmic integrity that contemporary performance demands is at such a visceral and high level. I'd like to say my rhythm's much better than it was 10 years ago. I think it is, you know, and it, it's still not what I want it to be, you know, but it's, it's like, you can't help but be inspired and influenced by the people and the, the music that you have around you. And just the thing that I love is, um, there's a really open, welcoming, come, try this. Even if, you know, you're new to it, that's fine. We're all new to it at some point. And just that kind of inviting atmosphere, I think, has really given us a lot of opportunity to try things and celebrate successes. So it's 
it's given me a lot more joy in my my music making. I think after this, I'm going to go practice. <laughs> and I've got uh, uh, my flute viola harp trio is going to be doing another recording in a couple of weeks. So I'm kind of very much in the zone of being sure I drill everything. I'm I'm wearing out my current metronome and in, in getting there. But you know, it's when Berkeley's working well, there's just so much creativity and so much joy. And I'm thankful to be a part of that. Well, thank you, um, David Wallace. And we're going to hang out for longer because there's so many things to talk about. Um, but I just want us to take a second and say thank you, Cheryl Bailey. Thank you, Ben Cody. Thank you, Doc Wallace. And everybody listening, we'll be with you on the next Coffee Talk. <laughs>